Good evening, folks. I'm Dr. Tan Nichols with Mayfield Brain and Spine. And today we're discussing leg pain, specifically several co frequent causes of leg pain, including sciatica, piriformis syndrome, and SI joint pain. Here are some simple diagrams explaining what these are. Easiest way to think of this is think of a river. So on the left, we have the sciatic nerve. So this is impingement for one reason or another of a nerve root making up the sciatic nerve, which runs down your leg. This would be like dumping something in the upper Ohio and having it go down the Mississippi River. On the, in the middle slide, we have piriformis syndrome. This is a bit lower. This is direct impingement of the sciatic nerve itself from an inflamed piriformis muscle. This would be analogous to dumping something at the confluence of the Mississippi and noticing it come down. If you were up the Ludlow Yacht Club, you wouldn't notice anything in the water because you'd be above the problem. On the right side, we have SI joint dysfunction. This is the equivalent to having a problem on the shore of your river and having some of it trickle into the river. So it's not directly impinging on the sciatic nerve, but it's causing irritation. Simple basic background here a little bit. This is a picture of the, of the spine. You have seven cervical vertebra in the neck, 12 thoracic vertebra in the rib cage area, five lower vertebra in the lower back, which is what we'll be talking about today, and then the sacrum, which makes up the lower part of the lower back and forms part of the pelvis, which is several fused bones. The SI joint is the joint between the spine and the hips. So that's the, the intermediate joint, if you will, has a small amount of rotation and can certainly be a pain generator. This is a picture of the nerves. Think of this like a highway and the off ramps. All the nerves come down the spinal cord and then peel off to various locations. At every level, they go between the bones and they can be pinched from either a bone spur, a disc herniation, or less likely an infection, a tumor, a fracture, or something of that nature. And we can oftentimes use where the pain is to work backwards to try to figure out where it's coming from. So each nerve should have pain in a relatively specific region. And it's like, again, like following a road map. If you're gonna go down a certain road, you're gonna get to a certain place almost every time. Pain comes in a couple different types, acute versus chronic. Acute is usually considered pain less than six weeks. Chronic pain is considered more than six weeks. Back pain comes in several different types. One is mechanical, which is what we call axial back pain. This is the pain that usually runs up and down your spine. This is usually from instability of the spine itself, which may be major instability from something like a fracture or something minor like degeneration and wear and tear. Radiculopathy is again that sciatica we talked about, which is pinching of a nerve root causing radiating pain down, down the back and leg. Myelopathy isn't usually a pain condition, but is a degree of spinal cord compression, which can cause weakness and dysfunction in the, in the nerves below that. And of course, what makes everything complicated is you can have all of them. Especially as we get older, you're gonna, you, got, you could have a disc herniation, which causes radiating symptoms, also causes mechanical back pain, and also if it's at the correct level, could cause myelopathy, which can make things complicated. These are some of the causes of back problems. You can have strains and sprains, things we call musc musculoskeletal. You could have disc problems, either wearing thin of the disc or, or herniations of the disc. You could have impingement of the nerves, as we talked about. You can have the facet joint irritation, which is the joints behind the nerves. You can have, as we talked about, fractures. Um, in addition to that, you could also have things like tumors and infections and other things of that nature. And then you can have adjacent joints, which are your sacroiliac joint, your hip joint. If you're up in the neck, you could your shoulders, but things of that nature. This is a picture of the sciatic nerve. So on the right, you see the nerve roots coming down again, like the river, right? So you have your Missouri and your Ohio, and they're all coming together to form your Mississippi as it runs down your leg. So the lower nerve roots in your lumbar spine come together to form the sciatic nerve as it runs down your leg. You can irritate that nerve, and then you get radiating pain down the leg. Classically, you have more pain in the leg than the back. It tends to start in the lower back or buttock and radiates down below the knee, oftentimes to the foot. It can be associated with some numbness or some weakness. It tends to be worse with extension. Um, what's called a, we call this a straight leg sign, where a care provider will straighten your leg out and increase the pain. That puts tension on that nerve. Oftentimes it's better with certain positions. Everyone says, oh, I can find a certain position at, at home. If I lay on one side and cock one leg at a weird angle, pain goes away. Because you find something that takes the load off of that spine. These, these are the main causes of nerve compression. You're gonna either have on the top a herniated disc or on the bottom what's called canal stenosis. So from a herniated disc, think of this like a jelly donut. You've got the firm outer, outer donut and then you have your jelly inside. Well, you've got a hole in your donut and your jelly's pushed out up against the nerve and that causes a combination of mechanical compression and also chemical irritation. On the canal stenosis, this essentially is just 
an old, old, old worn out donut that's been sitting on the shelf for too long. And as it thins and compresses, it, it puts general direct pressure on the nerves. Piriformis syndrome, irritation or spasm of the piriformis muscle, which is a deep muscle buried up in your butt. It's be, uh, deep to your gluteal muscles, so it's, it's all the way in there. And when that tightens or spasms, it can pinch on the sag nerve, which runs right below that. And it causes pain. Frequently causes pain more with hip movement, generally a more of a dull aching pain than the sciatic. The sciatic pain tends to be a little sharper, a little more crisp. Um, generally speaking, the piriformis pain stops uh, in the mid thigh, um, but can go, can go down farther. Uh, doesn't usually involve back pain, oftentimes worse with sitting, whereas generally speaking, sciatica gets worse when you're up and moving around. Again, everyone's a bit different, but in, in general, sitting makes it worse. Hip movement makes, it, makes your piriformis syndrome worse. SI joint pain, a little bit different. This is a direct mechanical pain in the SI joint itself, which is between the spine and your hip. So classically, you have more back pain and less leg pain. It tends to be right over the SI joint, which is essentially just above your butt cheek. It tends to radiate down the back of the thigh, sometimes into the groin, oftentimes the worst with flexion of your leg. So guys will tell me, I drive into work okay, but then I have to get up in the work truck and I just can't get my leg up in the truck. Or going up and down stairs is tough. Um, my leg feels weak, it buckles. Well, that's a common complaint. Generally not one you see with the other two syndromes. Doesn't tend to have pain all the way down to the foot. Doesn't usually have associated numbness or weakness. But again, you can also have overlapping syndromes as we talked about. You can also see SI joint dysfunction after pregnancy. Fairly common problem for women. So after birth, postpartum, women will have SI joint pain from the hormones that were released that causes those joints to loosen up. How do you figure out what you, what you have? It's like any other medical condition. You start with a history, and those are the simple, straightforward questions we ask you. When did this start? How long has it been going on for? What is the pain like? What makes it better? What makes it worse? You know, what other conditions do you have? What have you tried for treatment? And then we move on to the physical exam. We start out with the simple stuff, strength, strength testing, sensation testing, reflexes, you know, basic ambulation, watch you walk around. And then we move on to specific diagnostic tests that we can do at the bedside. Things like a straight leg raise, where we literally just straighten your leg out. That tends to trigger off sciatica. Things like the, what's called the forward and finger test. We ask you, where's your pain? And in sciatic pain, usually people, I'm sorry, SI joint pain, usually folks can point to one spot. That's right where the joint hurts. And then there's things like called the fair test that you can trigger that piriformis sy syndrome by stretching the piriformis muscle and causing it to spasm. That should theoretically reproduce your symptoms. After those, you have diagno diagnostic imaging tests. Those are x-rays, MRI, CT myelogram, potentially uh, nerve conduction studies and EMGs. Generally speaking, an MRI is gonna be your, your leading test here. As I've told many residents, x-rays really just get you the insurance approval to have the MRI. Uh, they can be helpful in some conditions, but generally speaking, they're just gonna show some wear and tear, especially as we all get older. We all have wear and tear in our spines. Doesn't really tell us much. The MRIs can give you a much better soft tissue look, generally reserving other tests for specific indications. Here's a picture of some provocative tests we can do for SI joint dysfunction. So what these tests do is they strain the SI joint without straining the other problems. So you can always make someone's pain worse. The key with these is it only makes your pain worse, usually, if you have an SI joint problem. So if I lay you on the bed, perform these procedures, if you have a disc herniation, they shouldn't get worse, or at least most of them shouldn't get worse. And none of these should trigger off your piriformis syndrome. So this helps to isolate what the problem is. Treatment. Like again, all these things start with the same basic foundation. Start with medications. Things like anti-inflammatories, which are going to be your leave, your naproxen, your Motrin, your Daypro, things of that nature. Uh, moving on to pain relievers, generally trying to avoid narcotics. So you're looking at Tylenol, uh, things like Neurontin, Gabapentin. And then moving on to physical therapy which we'll talk about a little bit later with Eric Mooney. So including that would be things like chiropractic care, Pilates, yoga, things of that nature. Um, physical therapy is an entire other, other paradigm, and he'll cover that in more detail later. But the goal there is basically to mobilize the person, loose, loosen up the nerve compression, and provide some core stabilization. If that doesn't work, you move on to things like injections. So classically, we're looking at epidural steroid injection for disc herniation, you're looking at sacroiliac injections directly into the joint and potentially piriformis injections, uh, which aren't done a lot and, and are kind of hard, hard to have a, a strong sense of whether they help or not, but some people will, will go in and try to inject the piriformis muscle directly. 
Then occasionally radio frequency ablations, although that's usually used for more of a chronic back pain situation. And finally, if that doesn't work at all, you look at surgery. A little physical therapy here, uh, which we'll cover later in more depth. Again, the goals of physical therapy, proper body mechanics, just like grandma told you, right? Sit up straight, you know, especially nowadays with uh, everyone working from home, you know, crunched up on a kitchen chair, looking at some tiny little laptop, or you get what they call a text neck from being on your phone all day long. You know, those are all bad things. Uh, we're not as active as we used to be. Additionally, they can help with gait and balance training and work on core strengthening, soft tissue mobilization, what's called manual therapy, which is just basically distraction where they try to strain things out, which starts to cross over a little bit with chiropractic care. Uh, historically, chiropractors came from a different, very different treatment paradigm, but increasingly physical therapy and chiropractic care are sort of becoming intertwined. One thing to remember is injections are often diagnostic as well as therapeutic. In addition to making you feel better, they can be used to either rule in or rule out a problem. These can include myofascial injections, epidural steroid injections for sciatica, sacroiliac injections for sacroiliac pain, or potentially hip injections. The goal there being to re remove the hip as a possible pain generator. So we inject your hip, the pain goes away, that suggests it's more likely from the hip. Conversely, if you have an injection in the hip and it doesn't help, we're probably dealing with something else. These are some sources of where the injections go, they're performed under x-ray fluoroscopy. You inject usually cortical steroids into the area to try to decrease the inflammation. Sometimes there'll be a local anesthetic component for a more regional block to provide the more diagnostic component. So while the steroids may not help long-term, if the local anesthetic, which is similar to Novocaine you'd have for a dental procedure, numbs that area and the pain goes away, that suggests we're working in the right area. If all these fail, then you can move on to surgeries. So for sciatica, if we're talking about disc herniation, you're looking at doing a discectomy or laminectomy. For piriformis syndrome, uh, potentially a piriformis muscle release. And for sacroiliac disease, you're looking at sacroiliac fusions. This is a picture of what you, how you treat a disc herniation. Go down there with either a tube or an open procedure with a microscope. Drill off the bone, which exposes the nerve. The nerve slides over to the side, and right below that is your extruded disc herniation, your jelly, if you will. You clean that out, and that takes the pressure off the nerve root. For a laminectomy, you're looking at a little different procedure. This is where the bone has, and joint material has compressed the nerves. So similarly, go down with either a tube or an open procedure and then drill off this bone and then clean out any additional arthritis along the course of the nerve roots. Rare occasion, you might need to do a fusion for one of these procedures, in which case you'd go between the discs, put in a, a spacer to stimulate some fusion, and then place pedicle screws uh, down into the bone to lock it in place while it fuses. For piriformis syndrome, this is a piriformis sectioning. Essentially, they'd open up your gluteal muscle, spread it apart, cut the piriformis muscle, and decompress the sciatic nerve. To be fair, this isn't done very frequently. Uh, there are people who feel strongly this is helpful. In my opinion, I haven't seen many people with good results from this, but it is an option for folks. For SI joint pain, assuming you've passed all, all the uh, diagnostic treatment algorithm but haven't had a tr good treatment result long-term, you can fixate this joint. So you come through minimally invasively through the side of, of the hip and place either screws or brooches across the SI joint to lock it in place. Some final words of wisdom here. Almost everyone's gonna have back pain at some point in their life. Um, some, sometimes you can control the factor, sometimes you can't. Some of those are genetic. It's too late to pick your parents at this point. And it's too late to change what you did in your, in your life before now. But going forward, things like weight reduction, increased activity level, proper body mechanics can play a big role. Finally, nicotine. Whether you're chewing, dipping, vaping, smoking, patching, whatever, all those cause problems. They cause osteoporosis, which is weakening of the bone. They accelerate degeneration of your discs by cutting down the amount of oxygen to the disc itself. And if you have surgery, they increase your risk of infection and they decrease your, your, your healing rate. I'll say about 25% of Kentuckians smoke. If you add in dipping and vaping and chewing, you're probably up to around low 30s. Over two thirds of my patients who have surgery smoke. So doing the math tells you that there's a pretty strong correlation. Next up would be uh, Eric Mooney with uh, Sandy's Physical Therapy, talking a little bit more in depth about the physical therapy option for these conditions. Good evening, my name is Eric Mooney. I'm a physical therapist with St. Elizabeth Healthcare, and I'm excited to be here with you this evening to 
discuss the physical therapy approach to sciatica, piriformis syndrome, and SI joint pain. Uh, before we get into the meat of the conversation, just wanna kinda of go over some of the things that we're gonna cover uh, for the next few minutes. Uh, the first thing that we wanna talk about is what is physical therapy and what to expect from your physical therapist. As a patient, you need to have a reasonable expectation on what you're walking into before starting a physical therapy regimen. Uh, the second thing we're gonna chat about is uh, how a physical therapist determines what the cause and the differences of sciatica, piriformis syndrome, and SI joint pain are. There's a lot of similarities between the three. So ultimately, we wanna make sure that we drill down to the source of the problem so we can treat things appropriately. And then the last two things we're gonna discuss about are both the conservative management of the three disorders, so anything prior to surgery, and any post-operative management of the three disorders. So who are physical therapists? What are we, what do we do? You know, what, what are you getting yourself into? Uh, the vision statement from the American Physical Therapy Association says that physical therapy is the, the goal is to transform society by optimizing movement to improve the human experience. So physical therapists are kind of experts in function and mobility. Uh, we have a lot of experience in evaluating and treating individuals with musculoskeletal problems, uh, identifying red flags, or those symptoms that just don't fit uh, the problem that an individual is coming in for therapy. And, and those type of problems may require the need to see an additional specialist or an additional provider. And we wanna identify those early so that every patient is seeing who they're supposed to be seeing. And then lastly, we're very experienced in developing a comprehensive program to increase the function and mobility of all of our patients. Uh, it's a patient-centered approach to develop a, a game plan based on the patient's needs and, and what we can anticipate is a, is a reasonable level of, of recovery. First, we've got to figure out what to treat. And the physical therapist is going to sit down with any patient and go through the evaluation process and initiate treatment for that problem. During this time is when we're going to identify those red flags, those, those things that may need uh, additional eyes to determine what the problem is, whether you know some of the more sinister problems such as a tumor or infection, but things that go outside of the scope of, of physical therapy. And then use those investigative skills to then develop that, that plan based on where the source of the problem is. So let's talk about these three diagnoses, sciatica, piriformis syndrome, and SI joint pain and what the difference is. Uh, according to the Mayfield Clinic's website, sciatica is pain that radiates along the path of the sciatic nerve from the low back, through the hip, down into the buttock, and even down to the leg. This pain can travel as far as the foot. Uh, it's typically one-sided pain. Very rarely do we see this impact both sides where patients get symptoms down both legs. It can happen, but it's on a much uh, less often basis. Uh, piriformis syndrome is very similar in presentation to sciatica. It's inflammation or spasm of the piriformis muscle that can also cause irritation near the sciatic nerve and can cause pain down into the buttock leg, similar to sciatica. The piriformis muscle is very unique in that it's a proximity to the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve runs either on top, underneath, or in some cases can even go right through the middle of the piriformis muscle. So with a limitation in space, any kind of spasm or contraction that causes that muscle to get shorter can create irritation on that sciatic nerve and then give symptoms very similar to sciatica. And then SI joint pain is typically pain in the low back, buttock, or hip that is more closely related to where the sacroiliac joint is located. And the sacroiliac joint is located right there at the base of the spine. This is an incredibly stable joint. This is basically that area where your upper half meets your lower half. So you can understand that that needs to be a very stable joint. And because of that, there's not a lot of movement in this joint. So when things start to move like they're not supposed to, it can cause some significant problems. So because of the similarities between these three problems, we have to work very hard to make sure we find the source. Where is this pain coming from? And so during our evaluation process, we're gonna start with the low back. And the reason we start with the low back is we're just playing the numbers game. Statistically, the majority of problems that radiate into the buttock, the hip, or the leg have a low back component. So we're gonna work to rule out any type of a low back problem and determine is that our primary pain generator. And so we're gonna look at range of motion. We're gonna look at strength. We're gonna provide uh, special tests and repeated movement testing to ultimately determine is this the source of your problem. 
Once we've ruled out the low back, then we're gonna to move to the hip. And the hip is more closely associated with the piriformis muscle. And that's when we're then going to determine is this possibly a piriformis problem or, or a hip problem. And again, looking at range of motion, strength, special test, ultimately trying to drill down to where's this coming from. Uh, if we've ruled out the lumbar spine, we've ruled out the hip, then we're gonna to move to the, to the SI joint. Uh, again, just playing the statistics, the SI joint is the least likely candidate to be the pain generator. It doesn't mean it can't be, but we're not going to start with the least likely. We're gonna start with the most and we're gonna to work to, to the least. So lastly, we'll examine the SI joint. Now with the SI joint, we're not necessarily looking at range of motion or strength. We may be looking at more of joint mobility. So you, your therapist may be doing more hands-on to determine is that joint moving correctly? Is it aligned the way that it's supposed to in order to determine is this the source of your pain? So once we've determined that source, then we're gonna get into the intervention component of your care. The, you and the therapist will have sat down, talked about your, your goals. The therapist is gonna develop this game plan that's patient-centered and then work with you to, to set up the intervention. And depending on where we are in the stage of your problem, that's gonna dictate where we go initially with our care. For more acute problems, things that have just recently come on, the intervention may be more focused on uh, reducing pain and reducing inflammation, restoring range of motion. We're not going to be as aggressive until some of those uh, inflammatory responses have started to reduce. Once that occurs and we can start to progress, then we're gonna look at muscle imbalances and strength and stability, looking to restore normal function. Uh, when we talk about muscle imbalances, I always compare that to a suspension bridge and that you need equal tension on both sides of that primary pillar. And if one side or one cable like a suspension bridge is pulling harder than the other, you don't have a very stable bridge. In the same regard with the spine, if one set of muscles is pulling harder than the other, it's going to throw off the function of the entire spine. So we need to work to determine where that imbalance lies so we can work to correct it. And then throughout the care, uh, we're gonna be discussing posture and body mechanics and, and ergonomics. Uh, over the last year with so many more individuals working from home and, and sitting at desks for prolonged periods of time, posture and body mechanics and ergonomics play into problems associated with the low back and the hips. You know, we, we put our spines in poor positions for extended period of time, and that time and stress are what ultimately lead to more problems. So we wanna make sure that not only are we addressing the problem in the moment, but we're also looking at some of the causes so that we can prevent recurrence in the future. So if conservative measures aren't successful and an individual needs surgery, physical therapy may be uh, involved on the post-operative side of that. And post-operative intervention, it's, it's very similar to, to pre-operative intervention with a few exceptions. Uh, we're gonna continue to focus on pain control and inflammation control, but we also wanna make sure we're promoting proper and safe healing. And we're looking to work within the restrictions and the precautions set forth by the surgeon. So everyone's heard the, well, you don't lift, you don't twist, you don't you know, squat, you don't bend uh, initially after surgery. And that's to make sure we're promoting healing. No one wants to go through surgery to then have to go through it all over again because we didn't follow those precautions early on. Uh, we wanna make sure we're setting a good base so that everything is successful after that. Uh, once we've managed to, to get a good handle on pain and swelling and inflammation, we can start to work through the other things. So in addition to, to those uh, differences, scar management and mobilization may be a part of post-operative care. Uh, scar formation is, is much different in that the tissue that forms a scar is, is much less pliable. It doesn't have the same elasticity that normal tissue does. So you and your therapist may be working to mobilize that scar so that the scar is not the restriction as you continue to heal. And then as I said, as, as healing continues, you and your PT will work uh, to promote your return to function. So that's going to include range of motion, strength, uh, continue that emphasis on pain control, as well as posture, ergonomics, and, and body mechanics. So as a patient, then what, what should you expect coming in to, to see a physical therapist? And, and the first thing to, to always understand is communication is key. Uh, between the patient, the physician, and the physical therapist, 
all three have to work as a team in order to, in, to address the patient's goals because my goals or the physician's goals are completely irrelevant if they don't align with our patient's goals. And that's where it's truly patient-centered care. Uh, our patients are the ones letting us know what their needs are so we can develop the plan that addresses that. The other thing to keep in mind is this is physical therapy. There's a physical component to it and the patient has to take an active role in their recovery. This is not a passive, uh, take two pills and call me in the morning. Th this is going to involve uh, activity. It's going to involve exercise. But ultimately, those are the tools in the education that as a physical therapist, I want to impart on my patients so that they have all the resources necessary to be successful in the future. Our goal isn't just to, to treat you in the, in the short term so that we get to see you again in six months when this flares back up. Physical therapy shouldn't be forever. I want my patients to have the tools necessary so that when they start to get the little bit of an inkling that, oh, I, I kind of tweaked that spot again, I need to resume some of the, the activities or some of the exercises that I was doing previously in order to get that under control so that ultimately they never have to come back and see me again. That's the best compliment that I could get is that they don't ever have to come back because they have all the tools necessary to be successful here on out. And that's the goal. If it's, if it's patient-centered and our goals and our treatment plans are, are set up to address the, the patient's needs, then we can be successful moving forward and into the future. So thank you guys for uh, participating or attending our webinar. We do have some follow-up uh, Q&A opportunity with our providers to, to be able to get your questions answered. But thank you for your time this evening.